Hey, everybody, welcome back to Matrix Mash. I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio, and with me is my good friend Robert Phoenix from 11th House Astrology. And there is so much going on that we're not going to waste much time with uh, introductions and pre show amble. There is so, so much stuff to discuss here. So we're just going to kind of, we have a list and we're going to kind of move down it. We're going to start with the uh, odd synchronicity of the uh, Malibu fires and uh, Gillette and uh, move our way through a whole list of. Uh, weird topics ending with possibly one of the weirdest things I've ever heard of. So, <laughs> Robert, welcome back. Hey, Emily, it's, it's great to be back. And uh, it's amazing just how much mind-melting content has accrued in the last, what, two to three weeks yep. since we've gotten together. Yeah. And uh, so we have a lot to talk about. And um, I'm, I'm really psyched about, you know, <laughs> what, we, what we can stir up today. do 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 <laughs> all righty so here we go so i was driving home from work it was about last week sometime and driving the same way that i always drive and something caught my eye that i somehow have either missed or not kind of fully gotten the implications of until the other day and that is that there's a sign um i i, I don't know if that sign exists headed one way in the freeway or just the, the other way or just the one i was going but when I was coming up to Las Virgenes, which is an exit that I get off at all the time, I do, I, one of my places that I stop to eat all the time is over there and whatever. And it's also, Las Virgenes is also known as Malibu Canyon Road. It's the uh, canyon that takes you from the 101 freeway to the beach. Um, as I was coming up to that exit, I noticed a sign that said King Gillette Ranch. And I thought, oh, wow, look at that. Um, I thought, this is some serious Ole Damagard territory, right? Where they leave the clue of what the next sort of event or hoax or psyop or false flag will be at the last one, right? So we had these uh, Wolsey fire that led from Chatsworth to Malibu that I at some point will say all the things I have to say about, but that time is not now because that one is a super interesting one. But that was going on and that really captured a lot of our attention for the months of, of basically October and November, right? And then we moved into this weird stuff with... Um, Gillette in January, right? And this Gillette ad, and you brought up some of these uh, connections of uh, Gillette being the vest and these yellow vest protests and all of this fallout we're starting to see now around this, you know, whole Gillette thing. So, wow, there's part of me that feels like I, we need to talk to Ole Damagard and see what he thinks of this one and let him pull all those strings. But sounds like you've been looking into this a little bit too. So, what do you yeah, think about King Gillette Ranch, Robert? Well, you know, the King Gillette Ranch is, it's a, it's a, uh, a, it's a state park. So people can actually go there, hang out, check it out, you know, be a part of it, experience it, explore it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it also was at one time the, uh, the home of King Gillette, the guy who is the, was the founder of, Gillette. Let me see if I can just grab this here and just give you guys a visual as to what the. It's a beautiful uh, structure. It's uh, it's it's Spanish in its motif. I'll give you a visual here. Let me show you what it looks like. Um, it's a really really beautiful structure. It's I guess I guess the uh, the equivalent would be something along the lines of you know, where Henry Ford lived in Florida, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be very similar in some ways. So this is uh, one part of Gillette Ranch. It's also kind of like, you know, his San Simeon. Mm -hmm. This would be kind of the Hearst, Hearst his version of, of the Hearst world. Right. And uh, so it's intact. Of course, there was no fire there. Um, and one of the things that we talked about last time was how King Gillette was – a 33rd degree Mason. Uh, he was, he was also a hardcore globalist and in his version of globalism, it was kind of a Fabian socialist model where theoretically the people, you know, were the ones that were in charge of this massive global corporation. So it's a strange fusion of having this overarching kind of you know, system and, and which interpenetrates everything. Right. And it's the people who are all part of that same system. And in fact, he wanted to hire Teddy Roosevelt to be a part of this kind of 
new model. He was going to pay him a huge amount of money uh, back in uh, Teddy Roosevelt's days, which were the 1930s, to help you know grow this model. And one of his ideas was to take Niagara Falls and use Niagara Falls as a source of power to generate this massive kind of global city, right? Yeah. So this guy had big visions, big plans, and it's, it's also very interesting that he, his company was purchased eventually by Procter & Gamble, who have had a long history of being uh, involved in you know, very dubious practices in terms of their products, in terms of their images, in terms of their symbolism. You know, Procter & Gamble was targeted back in the 1950s and 60s as being satanic. So right. the stuff that we talk about now has been around for a long time. Yeah, Procter um, & Gamble is also located just about third, there's or at least one of their headquarters or manufacturing sites is located just about uh, 25 or 30 miles up the road in Oxnard from, from where King Gillette Ranch is. So that's, yeah. And also right. be located between the freeway and the beach. And in fact, I bet it would be interesting to check the line between Gillette Ranch and, and Procter and & Gamble. Right, how, how many miles it is and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What kind so, of line so, they're both on. so we just wanted to kind of, you know, circle back to this because it's interesting how we have the fires and then right there on the precipice on the edge of the fires in Southern California, here's King Gillette Ranch. And then we go right. into the Gillet Jean, which is still going on, by the way. And of course, the. Uh, and that's the connector between King Gillette Ranch and then the Gillette ad. So the yellow vest. That's right. Because the, event, the events, right. It yeah. connects the two events. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting to you know, piece these things um, together. Have, and, you looked at, uh, have you looked at all at how much this has damaged Gillette as a company? Uh, I haven't looked at the sales figures, but I'm assuming mm -hmm. it's damaged them significantly. When I was um, at uh, when I was at CVS the other day, they were having a huge sale on like Gillette cartridges and power, you know, kind of things. Because usually those things are really expensive, right? They're but very expensive. I mean, having a know, huge sale on them, yeah. Shaving is shaving is one of the big big scams, uh, right. you know, in our in our <laughs> culture. So hi, Jasper. Jasper's decided to get in on. Yeah, Olivia's here. She's overlaying on on her divine blanket on my bed, but um. So, so I I just need to manage him to the point where he's no longer manageable. In which case, <laughs> I have to do something uh, drastic. Kick him, kick him off Mashup Island. Yes, a few weeks ago, Olivia knocked over a flower vase during during a recording of a show. Bad, so bad yes, girl, yeah. bad girl. <laughs> right now, she's napping sweetly on the divine blanket. So, um. So I just thought it would be good for us just to start off and circle back because yeah. That's an event that's happened. You were the one that noticed it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you maybe know. I'll send, maybe I'll send this uh, over to Ole Damagard. Maybe have a conversation with Ole Damagard or something. That'd like. be very interesting. Yeah. Just, to, just, in, just in terms of the location. I like Ole. He's, you know. I've never, I've never met him or spoken to him, but he, he seems like a decent guy. And I, maybe I could kind of give him the full download on some of the other stuff behind the Woolsey and Malibu fires and see what he could dig out with that. And if that's any connection to to some of this further, uh, it'd be interesting to see if, uh, so like I'm of the opinion and suspicion that there is a bay, either a base that extends from where Woolsey Canyon starts in Chatsworth over to where the, the end spot is in Malibu over there, either mm -hmm. a base or that there's a high speed train that connects two bases that are at those, both of those spots. Because at Woolsey Canyon and Chatsworth is where Rockadine and um, uh, what's the other one? Um, Boeing are, and mm -hmm. then you know where things ended up. You know, over in Malibu, we know we you know always heard a lot about that base over there, kind of at the edge in Malibu. And I would want I wonder sort of what King Gillette Ranch has to do with sort of that. It, it might have something to do. The other, you know, the other base that people talk about is the is the base on Catalina Island. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I know someone who's been spending a lot of time going out to. Uh, Catalina Island and sort of. And I've actually heard there is, there is mm -hmm. an underground beneath the ocean train, right? Yeah. Well, I, the, I think it's the whole thing. I, I think it may just be one big one, all the way from Chatsworth, and may even extend farther than Chatsworth. May even extend to like the Antelope Valley, which is where a lot of these cloaked craft, the craft that are in the clouds, are, uh, emanate from. Right. Is this that ba this uh, you know base over in, in Antelope Valley? So this could be almost one either continuous thing or different sort of hubs that are connected by high-speed train 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also, so my friend who's been going out and checking out Catalina, one of the things that Catalina is associated with that I didn't really know is er, like early uh, creation of like certain kinds of audio. There was all these, there was an audio studio there, right? Yeah. And I mean, think about this, a lot of the uh, stuff that goes on in uh, bases and technologies that they use really has to do with sound. Mm -hmm. right you know that's part of how they're controlling people too is I mean, totally how they're controlling people is light and sound obviously right so right. what were they doing out there on Catalina Island yes to this so, day there to this day there's still not really cars or anything out there it's like a very weird time it's a very, it's, a like, very it's, it's almost like that the tv show the prisoner mm -hmm. you know that that was that. very popular was, oh you got to see the prisoner hmm. that that came out in the 1960s 19 66, 67, and uh, it's with um, Patrick, um, uh, what's his name? Pa Patrick, Patrick, Mc 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 that's not Patrick McGowan, Patrick, uh, I always get confused with Patrick McNee, who he's related to, who is in the, uh, the Avengers. Hmm. Anyway, um, it's, a, it's a really kind of groundbreaking, both The Prisoner and The Avengers were hidden in plain sight Mm -hmm. TV shows that were produced by the BBC. Okay. Pat, uh, yeah. Uh, so Patrick McGowan is mm -hmm. Patrick McGowan is great. He's a great actor, and he's been in a ton of really interesting films. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you've ever seen the movie Scanners, he plays the doctor in Scanners. Ah. It, the whole movie Scanners is connected to uh, McGill and all the yep. mind control. Totally. Stuff. Yep. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, getting back to Catalina Island, it, there, there are two things that are, I think, of interest. This whole train thing that you're talking about. Yeah. Now, suppo supposedly, there is a one-way rail system. Now, it may be a bit different than some of the military trains, mm -hmm. but there's a, a, supposedly there's a one-way, like, Mach 3 yep. train system that, yep. that goes all around the world in one direction, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get on in Washington, D.C., and you could be in California an hour later or something like that. Yeah. That's, how, that's how fast it is. So yeah. I'm not sure if the Catalina experience or the Catalina Express is connected up to this train, although it could be because it does have to go underneath the ocean, right? Yeah. There's very interesting train tracks and activity at the, where Woolsey Canyon starts in Chatsworth as well, mm -hmm. um, go running through that whole area. Yeah. Uh, on the surface and so it would make sense that you would make something underground that sort of paralleled what was on the surface like just in terms of you know um from what i understand like the kind of the uh, thing that i understand both intuitively and in terms of other things i heard in discussions i've had with people that too that this train may be quote unquote like drive pod like not a full train not like tons of cars like you get in your own little pod and you just scoot along right on that and it sort of you know yeah it's a yeah that, yeah, that, that, uh, that totally makes sense. And it may also use sort of space and time folding technology, whereas part of the way they're able to travel, it isn't just that it's so fast, it's that it folds the space between two things like a taco shell, mm -hmm. right? So like, here's Los Angeles, here's Washington, D.C., where they're a lot closer if you fold it like a taco shell, so you fold space and then the time between the two are very short. I've heard that the technology of these trains is much like the, the technology in pneumatic tubes. Yeah, and and they're really just yes. you know traveling basically on compressed air. Compressed air, and that's why they were able to travel so quickly. Yeah. The other thing about Malibu is that that's where Marilyn Monroe went before she became Marilyn Monroe. Ah. She was she was actually married to a, a soldier mm -hmm. on Malibu, right? Mm -hmm. And she, you know, I think that's where she got some reprogramming. Yeah, was when she was hanging oh, out there. Definitely a really weird place. I worked at, in Malibu in the early 90s mm -hmm. um, and definitely had some, it's a very strange crossing grounds, right? The kind of people that come through there. There's a lot of homeless people, even though it's a very wealthy community because the weather is nice, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of celebrities there, obviously. Obviously, there's a lot of wealthy people, but it's a misnomer that Malibu is only wealthy. There's lots of people there that have had generational land passed down to them. So they live there, but they're not necessarily wealthy. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Um, I would say I had some of the strangest experiences of my life there. 
It's got a very weird vibe. Weird vibe, yeah. Very weird vibe. It's a, it's also it's also beautiful. There's people come from all oh. over the world to check it out. So, yeah. And even the boat ride out there is great. So it's a nice little boat ride. And then the uh, I had something else I was going to say about Catalina real fast. What was it? Oh, I, 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 he's not someone whose work I follow closely or anything like that. But I remember years ago also hearing L. A. Marzulli talk mm -hmm. about um, the Smithsonian finding the red, the giants with the red hair buried in places on Catalina. And, you know, when they'd be called out there stealing all that stuff and hiding it like they do with everything else. Right. 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 Yeah. So, Makes, you know, the giants. Why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, if I was a giant, I'd want to hang out on Malibu too. <laughs> right. Great. All right. So that's kind of circle back on there. Where, we, what, where are we moving to next? We're going to get into the, uh, Circle back to another piece of work we did on our show on Off Planet Radio earlier this year, where we kind of did our breakdown of Joe Rogan. Maybe we can, maybe we should even link that in the in the show description here because uh, interesting. Yeah, you, well, you and I mashed up with Joe, mm -hmm. uh, what a couple of months ago. Well, and, and it was when you were on Off Planet, and that was what it was during that show that we decided to start doing Matrix Mash because oh, that okay. one went so well. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. All right. So, yeah, we, we got into the Joe Rogan stuff, I think, before a lot of other people got into the Joe Rogan stuff. Yeah, and that was and that was that that was you and you were and and that was on the heels of uh, Alex Jones and uh, who also Elon Musk. It was the Elon Musk. Elon, and Musk and, Elon Musk had been on Chuck Palahniuk. Like there had been like a weird day where there was like Chuck Palahniuk and someone else on in the same day. Right. And there I was there was there was the there was the scooter, the scooter uh, Jennings. The shooter Jennings. Shooter Jennings. Shooter Jennings, right. When he was trying to browbeat and there had been the Candace Owens thing. And then shortly after we did that, then he had Tulsi Gabbard on. There was like all these Right. So this was Joe basically uh flexing his new tail feathers. Yeah. Because he had shed and molted his tail feathers that were connecting him to people like Alex. The, the fake moon landing, Jan the conspiracy Urban. stuff, yeah. So he had new tail feathers, yeah. That he, that he wanted to, to you know, to to fan, yeah. And and that's when he started to get heavy with people, and he yeah. started to kind of browbeat, and 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 you know, use his kind of more you know rational side, and yep. you could see him migrate, you know, over to you know the you know the dark intellectual web and you know, sort of this, this new cadre that was taking over the narrative of the internet when it came to the, you know, the discourse around things like truth, freedom of speech, yeah. uh, and, you know, conspiracy. You know, they were going to now control the narrative around that. He's so Joe, doing a lot of dance, doing. He's doing a lot of dancing around, you know, he's doing a lot of like, well, I believe in freedom, but with restrictions like this and that, like he's, he's, he's really starting to look silly and he really made a huge, I mean, it be, for anybody who, the problem with Joe Rogan, and, and again, I say this as a person who has for years enjoyed the Joe Rogan podcast and on occasion still does, um, but there's a huge problem with Joe Rogan. And this interview he did last week with Jack Dorsey, I think, was maybe a final straw in, you know, the people who were refusing to see it now being able to, to very well see it. You know, he had Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter on and, you know, gave him the most softball interview that one could ever give someone. Here you have the person who is basically, you know, a, um, a fulcrum point for the future of free speech on a certain level on the internet. You have him there. He's been accused of, you know, biased banning and all of this kind of stuff. And you just throw him softball. I mean, it wasn't even softballs. It was T-balls. No, he, no, he, no, let's be clear. He was stroking Jack Dorsey. Stroking him. That's what he was doing. And, and Go ahead. And, and he, you know, people as the show was happening were thumbs downing it. The number of thumbs down on this show was th about three to four times as high as the number of thumbs up. And there was negative, I mean, I've never seen so many negative comments on a Joe Rogan show and he was delete either him or his, uh, you know, his, uh, I can't remember the name of his, uh, Jamie, uh, Kil Jamie or something, that person who kind of his producer was mm -hmm. deleting comments or, you know, sure it's possible YouTube is, but then they're in on this. They were, I mean, Sargon of Akkad made a comment on there that had the most amount of replies and, and, you know, thumbs up and thumbs down on it. And they deleted that one. So any, anything that was really critical in an intellectual way of either Rogan or Dorsey was being deleted. 
and then people got upset. I mean, within hours, there was all of these videos about people being upset about the fact that Joe Rogan, you know, had this opportunity and, and you know, softballed it. And now Joe Rogan has been sort of trying to explain this away and just making himself look sillier and sillier and sillier. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So let's be clear. One of the reasons why he had Jack Dorsey on the show and one of the reasons why he was so, you know, bromantic with him mm -hmm. is the fact that Jack Dorsey is one of the sponsors Cash of his out. podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this gets into this whole realm of who is in whose pocket, who sponsors who, and where do they get the money from? What's the agenda? Because apparently there's Soros money mm -hmm. inside of Rogan's uh, podcast. Oh, really? Yeah, th and these are claims. I that, hear people saying that, but I didn't know that there had actually been looking into that. Done. These are claims that Alex Jones has been making. Alex Jones, like two days ago, publicly came out and ripped Rogan in a in a really uh, very direct Alex Jonesian kind of fashion. And he says, "I don't hate Joe Rogan. I find him revolting, revolting." And he had even worse things to say about. Jack Dorsey. And one of the things that Jones talked about was that uh, Dorsey was behind a, he was, he was one of the, he says that he was one of the people behind Bitcoin and that Bitcoin was a pump and dump scam. And, and he calls Dorsey out for being a part of that. He also calls Dorsey out as being part of the NSA, uh, which I don't have any problem with uh, because you get into all the, you know, the, kind of the intelligence-based Silicon Valley stuff, it's going to circle back to the NSA. It's going to circle back to the CIA, but mostly the NSA. Say goodbye to Jasper. <laughs> Hi, Jasper. Jasper. Jasper's going to be taking a little time out. Oh. On the floor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, now we're looking at, well, who is Jack Dorsey? You know, where does he come from? What are his ties to? This is a really interesting time we're living in. You know, credibility is something that cannot be bought. It cannot be manufactured. And once you lose it, you're fucked, okay? Mm -hmm. You're totally fucked. And we saw this also with the Super Bowl. Like, okay, I'm going to try to tie these two things together. If you go back and look at the game between the Los Angeles Rams and the New Orleans Saints, there is a play at the end of that game where a Rams player – commits two egregious penalties on a New Orleans Saints player, which theoretically affects the outcome of the game. The chances of New Orleans winning that game are about 98.9% Okay, if that penalty is called. It's not. And as a result of that, the Rams wind up winning the game, and they go on to the Super Bowl. I can't tell you how many comments that I saw – on a number of platforms that we're talking about that, that number one, the Super Bowl is fake. And number two, I haven't seen as many comments about the NFL being fixed mm -hmm. as I have with this Super Bowl. Now people I've been on I've this. I've never heard that from before. Think, uh, people who've always sworn to me that sports was real are like, nah, now I think it's fixed. That's right. So, yeah. so okay, this is important. I've, I've been talking about this for years. Right, I, I was getting, I, you know, I had, uh, what's his name, uh, Tui, uh, the author uh, of- uh, Brian Tui. Brian Tui, I had him on my show a couple of times. Yeah. The fix is in, we talked yeah, about Yeah, I remember, it. yeah. And this was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's like, I would say that the comments on the game being fixed are about four to one. Four being, yeah, it's fixed, and one being, no, how can you? So the tide is turning here. This is a really interesting shift in our collective consciousness. Like, and I know that there are people at the NSA and, and you know, a number of other groups that are watching how people are responding to what's going on because, like, the veil is being ripped away. NFL's fixed, fake, fake Super Bowl, Joe Rogan, sellouts. Mm -hmm. He's he's kowtowing to Jack Dorsey. Mm -hmm. surveillance state if you go down far enough right mm -hmm. 
that's what's happening and people right? are seeing this now so but listen to the, listen to this okay actually finish your thought and then i'll tell you well, what that's I'm it that's, that's all i want to okay so listen to this though so you have to remember here the hit that okay the history between joe rogan and alex jones and where it comes from right so I was talking to a table at my work last night. I overheard them talking about Joe Rogan. And these look like total normies. And I could tell by some of the things I brought up that they were, although they found everything I had to say fascinating. They were actually at this point sympathetic to a certain level with Alex Jones, right? And it just kind of, not that I haven't thought about this before, but think about it. Like Joe Rogan is doing with Jack Dorsey, the same shit that Alex Jones is doing with Donald Trump, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think they're being controlled by the same handler. Could be. I think Joe Rogan and Alex Jones, I don't, I, I don't know if they're um, consciously aware that they're in on this together or if they're both being manipulated and it's possibly by that CIA agent that Joe Rogan has on the show, right? Because think about this. They're, the nexus point, right, the, where those two sort of come together is around Sacred Cow Productions, right? Kevin Booth's thing where, that Bill Hicks was a part of. Joe Rogan had some association with that when he was younger. It's how he, he's friends with Kevin Booth right? So is Alex. That's a common guest that they have both had on their show, you know, at, at times, right? Alex Jones and Bill Hicks had that very strange time of crossing over where they were in, you know, at the Access Television and where they were covering Waco, right? And it seemed that, you know, as Bill Hicks's health and life declined, Alex Jones suddenly kind of appeared and picked up. And I'm not of the opinion that Alex Jones is Bill Hicks, which I know a lot of people are, but I think that the controllers love that possibility in that story because there is something there. I don't, I read this book one time that a friend of mine who's a huge Bill Hicks fan had, it was like some kind of biography of Bill Hicks. Right. And in there it detailed this one idea that Bill Hicks had for a character and that character matches exactly who Alex Jones is. Right. Right. Exactly. So this is an operation, you know, I, I, I actually think Bill Hicks is a pretty clean guy and that's why he's not here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> clean in terms of like his intent and maybe by the time he realized what he might have been caught up in, you know, whatever, I don't know. But the connections between Hicks and Rogan and Hicks and, and Jones, are, you know, and that whole sacred, this is a sacred cow. This is something that you cannot touch. This idea that we're talking about here that a seemingly opposing sides are controlled by the exact not only the same faction but maybe even the exact same hand right mm -hmm. because i've not heard alex jones complain about the fact that joe rogan has that cia agent on over and over and over again mm -hmm. right the other thing the, the thing that constantly joe rogan brings up as the problem with alex jones is his stance on sandy hook right well alex jones is first of all in my opinion compared to stances that other people have taken in the alternative media alex jones's stance on on sandy hook is pretty tame right he did the same thing with sandy hook that he does with everything right he said that that there was a false flag mm -hmm. he said that there was elements to it that were fake right he didn't go into some of the really really in-depth kind of stuff that other people went into which there's probably a lot of truth to some of these things that these other people went into he was pretty tame on it but Sandy Hook was really the one, like, you know, that, that, that they set out to cause a certain, a really big kind of divide between certain kinds of people and these people that think that things are fake and that things are not fake. And that saying that, you know, people, dead children, right, that when, when they run out of things to divide the people, you go for the spot, the thing about, oh, but children die, right? Right. So, you know, like Sandy Hook. Like, well, yeah, it, it's, it's the... It's the capitalization of innocence. Right. So Sandy Hook is like a real, like Sandy Hook was the new 9-11, right? Absolutely. Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook is actually the new Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? Because you're either a Holocaust denier or you're a Holocaust believer. And the That's same right. thing with Sandy Hook. Either you think kids died or you didn't think kids died. And if you think kids died, you're saintly. And if you didn't think kids didn't die, then you're, you're you know, you're some evil demon, right? Right. And so here they have, you know, that's what this whole thing is about. Like, that's Joe Rogan's big problem with Alex. Joe's known Alex for years and knows that he, Alex has stuff like this to say about every little thing that goes on. Why would this one be the problem other than this is that sort of big setup? Be, well, be, because it's the Maginot line. You cross the line and you lose yeah. your sponsors. I mean, I don't that's know. That's really what it's about. I mean, he, mm -hmm. had, he had to sacrifice Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. And he's being sacrificed himself now. Well, he is because he, 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 when you get into that sacrificial mode and it's, mm -hmm. it's done it, like, look, we sometimes we have to make sacrifices in our lives. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Yep. If, you have, if, you have a, if you have a child, 
you have to make certain sacrifices. You, you know, spend more time with the kid, less time, you know, running around and getting high or you're partying or whatever. That's a sacrifice. It's part of the deal. Yep. So there are healthy sacrifices, mm -hmm. but then there are unhealthy sacrifices. And those sacrifices, you're usually a price to pay for those sacrifices. And yeah. now we're seeing... He sacrificed yeah, Alex Jones, and he's yes. he's been sacrificed. He's been humiliated publicly he's by the price because because he's participating ultimately in a lie. Mm -hmm. And he's being sacrificed right now because he's being mocked and shamed, and for the first time in his career, really having people make videos where they're shaming and mocking and making fun of him, and not just for smoking pot and talking about Bigfoot. This right. is really like Joe Rogan is a pussy, right? And Joe Rogan's part of his whole persona is built around his, you know. He's being macho. MMA and macho and being an alpha male and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and this is a takedown of that. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I don't think people could accuse Joe Rogan of being like toxically masculine. Right. Um, because he certainly doesn't come across that way no. in some ways. Right? Yeah. So you can't really go there, kind of lump him into that. But he's alpha. You can be alpha without being. Uh, yeah, I think I think he. Yes, I agree. And yeah. I agree. And I think, to a large extent, right? We're looking at like two models of people in the media or alternative media that have stood out for for young men, and one is Joe Rogan, and the other is Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. and for different kinds of reasons. Like Joe Rogan is the big brother that like some of these young guys look up to or the cool uncle yeah the cool yeah cool uncle big brother it's like yeah i can count on him he's tough yeah he's smart he doesn't take any he's shit. gonna take me elk hunting yeah yeah he's gonna get high you know yeah and then jordan peterson is is the is the father the intellectual father mm -hmm. that explains the why it's authorial father right explains why it's important to clean your room Mm -hmm. So these two guys have had a kind of a two-pronged uh, presence in the, yep. the hearts and minds of young men. Mm -hmm. And now Rogan's being disassembled. Mm -hmm. And Peterson, I believe, is next. Mm -hmm. I think the disassembling process of Jordan Peterson is about to begin. By the way, we are planning a, a, a Matrix mass, MASH special at some point where we kind of mash uh, on some, some the different sides of Jordan Peterson. I think we should probably do that sooner rather than later. Yeah, so so that's it's an interesting yeah kind of model to look at in terms of you know male icons, mm -hmm. how they've affected young men, right? And you know to some extent in, in a positive way. And, and even the same thing could be said for Alex Jones in a in a different way. Like he wasn't quote unquote a male role model, but he was for a lot of people for a long time some sort of uh, truth or um, uh, you know model, right? Think of well, how many Alex, people. Alex was a Texan. Right, didn't take any yep. shit, uh, calling people out, you know. But when Says Alex things that other people won't say, all that right. kind of stuff, free, yeah. Right, but you know, when push came to shove, and Alex had to defend himself, he folded. You know, he he pussied out. He folded. <laughs> Joe Rogan's gonna fold, and I think uh, Jordan Peterson may be slightly more formidable, but we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, George, yeah, Jordan ultimately, Peterson I fold. think he'll. He'll he'll fold to you. I, your your sound just went. Oh, I don't oh know no, now you're there. You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, there was something else about Alex that I wanted to bring up. Oh yeah, it had to do with the money thing. Alex Jones makes. He's been on the record. He makes forty million dollars gross with Infowars. Wow. And that that's selling an awful lot of supplements, don't you think? Mm hmm I mean, he also. I don't know if he gets money because he's syndicated on radio. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he gets money to be syndicated, like shows or like stations are paying him for syndication rights. That may be part of his income stream as well. Uh, but he makes a shitload of money. Mm -hmm. and he's very upfront about that. So I think he's getting money from somebody else as well. Sure. It's just like, I mean, I mean you look just at like the, Joe. I mean, how like Joe. Joe. Joe, I mean, remember back in the day when the podcast was still really good, how he would read the commercials online for like the Fleshlight and for his own supplements and things like that. You don't ever hear any of that on the show anymore, right? right. So they're not concerned with people buying stuff. These people who are his sponsors are all largely silent sponsors. Right. 
So what right. are they sponsoring? So what's keep what's pushing their skin an agenda in the game? To what he talks about that will ultimately forward their agenda. This That's is about not so much about game. selling products as it is about selling ideas. That's right. Yeah. Selling ideas, uh, selling social movements. Yeah. Selling, selling a slice of culture, right? S selling, uh, you know, a certain level of control is cool. Yeah. But I think it gets into a much bigger territory uh, about who's on whose payroll inside the alt media or inside, you know, truth media or however you want to slice mm -hmm. and dice it. And I think there's a group, like, I don't think Nathan Stoltman's on anybody's payroll. Nope. Okay. Uh, I don't think uh, Jake Morphonios is on anybody's payroll. Jake Morphonios has gotten awfully weird. He's gotten awfully mean and defensive and weird and like, yeah. But I don't think he's on anybody's payroll. No, I don't think I could, so either. I could be wrong, but I don't yeah. think he is. But you go up a few levels, now you're in the payroll world, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying that he's on somebody's payroll, but how does Joseph Farrell make a living? Mm -hmm. Does he sell enough books to actually... He writes an incredible amount of books. Right. He does write a lot of books. He does write a lot of books. And yeah, I don't, but I don't, I mean, he has a background that would indicate that, you know, he is, could be, inv be involved in, in, you know, he has a degree in, a, a, a degree in patristics, right? So he, you know, as he knows a lot about theology, he's obviously a literary scholar on a lot of levels. And um, I don't know. Uh, I just, I just think at some point there's going to be another discussion about how people in this world that you and I are in, mm -hmm at a higher level, how, 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 do they, how do they survive? Yeah. Who's paying their bills? Yep. And I think, I think at some point more of this is gonna come out. Well, I mean, it's, you know, like for people like you and I, like we make, make a few shekels here and there from, from what we're doing. You know, we, we use Patreon and we certainly don't make, make enough for me to stop doing my day job, right? Like it makes, you know, makes things a little bit easier and affords us, you know, the ability to do, to do some, things that we need to do to make the show interesting and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, like for people who are, um, I, mean, I don't want to say I'm suspicious because I, I do think that if I spent all of my time working on the show, I could probably turn it into something where I was making enough money to live off of, right? Um, but people, there's people out there who are making enough money to live off of and seemingly in, in the, making plenty of money, right? And yeah, like it, it, it just seems hard. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it is interesting because there's some people out there who don't seem to, you know, a Joseph Farrell, right? Who like, it's not like he has a show he's doing every day or he has sponsors that we're aware of or anything like that. Yeah, it is interesting. You know, like, I don't know, you know, it's one of those things that it's like. Um, and here's, here's the deal. If people are getting money, does that, does that negate their message? Does, you know, I mean. Then you have to look at who's giving the money. I mean, do you approve of it? What's, what's their agenda? I mean, my, my feeling on this has always been that, like, it, good information is good information. It doesn't actually matter where it comes from, right? But what happens is, is somebody might get one or two pieces of good information from somebody, and then they make, for, they make them a god. They make them their information god, and there's a cult that forms around them. And so then all of a sudden, everything this person says is important or valuable or whatever, and that's just not true. I've gotten great information from people I despise and bullshit from people that I love. And so each piece of information always, if you're trying to find truth, has to be discerned on its own, on its own merits. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. You know, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of discernment, you want to you want to get into the Virginia thing? Yeah, I was going to say we had brought up sacrifice, so <laughs> let's go into uh, the Virginia thing. Oh boy, so yeah, this has been going on for a couple of weeks, and we have like what it's kind of turned into is this like um, overshadowing of the idea of infanticide with the most, much more important problem of racism. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there, yeah. And that's one of the. It's one of the, you know, seamy subtexts around this whole thing. Mm -hmm. We're having a different discussion. And the discussion isn't about slaughtering newly born babies, ritually right. slaughtering them. It's about, you know, white man bad. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like, that's what it's de-evolved into. I wanted to, I wanted to show you this, because there's, there's some weird stuff with this. Okay. I, th I found this one image. Um, and, it, you know, just because people like Justin Fairfax and Ralph, Ralph Northam happen to be Democrats in occupying the same general office space in the same building doesn't mean they're really 
blinker together. I wanted to show you this. This is a very interesting sort of edit from the Democratic ticket where you can see, well, there's Northam, okay. And then right there, there's Justin Fairfax. Mm -hmm. and then right below him, there's Mark Herring. These are the three guys that you want to vote for. Okay. Well, then look what happens. Where does Justin Fairfax go? Right? Now, all of a sudden, this, was, this is the later sort of hand, handout that is, well, you got Ralph Northam and you got Mark Herring. But uh, Justin Fairfax isn't there anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting, you know, that even in their own party that, well, you know, yeah, he's a Democrat. But, uh, you know, maybe he's black or maybe he's just going to be me and Mark, you know, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> you know, and the guy still got elected. But it's unusual. Maybe not. It's unusual. I just thought that this was odd. Yeah, that, that is that, odd. That they would change the, 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 the roster. Right, from going right. from Northern Fairfax to Herring to Northern and Herring. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that in. Was the... Fairfax not up for re election? No, he got re elected. Okay, I, mean, I didn't know yeah. if that, I didn't know if those no. elections all always occur at the same time. It was, time all, or... it was all, all concurrent. Okay. So, and one of the things that Ralph Northam really capitalized on was the fact that Ed Gillespie, who was the governor at that time, that Ed Gillespie allowed for the Charlottesville rally to happen okay right so he he had ads where they were mocking ed gillespie and the whole car thing yeah chasing with the confederate flag and all that yeah, stuff, right? so, yeah. so so it, it's ironic that he would use these tactics right and, and then you know have this piece of information that was surfaced and here's yeah. here's what i think i i think that when his opposition research would have been Gillespie. Mm -hmm. I think the opposition research um, couldn't find that yearbook photo. Mm -hmm. I think that the yearbook photo had been scrubbed or deleted or held in abeyance. And I think that was sprung. And I'm pretty sure that people inside the Democratic Party sprung that. Yep. So that they could, you know, use this against northam or, or have it stick to northam and change this debate around the debacle absolutely well, i mean totally like the, to me this whole thing i mean everybody's looking at all this stuff and they're you know but the, what came clear to me is that you had this thing with the late-term abortion and the infanticide right and both to take attention off of that but also to put in everybody's face that issues related to race are more important than issues related to life Right. So they were virtue signaling that, that, that they are the party of, you know, the, the, that's it, of identity politics first. Right. And right. the one group of people that don't get to have an identity are babies. Right. Right. And so yep. like this is a, like a very interesting, um, you know, it's a it's a change the conversation kind of thing. But it's also a way of putting out in front of everybody. And so when people go along with this, when people are like, I mean, cause yeah, I, all these SJWs think that it's much more important your stance on, you know, what, you know, racial equality and all that kind of stuff than on right to life. Right. Like, so they're really letting, putting it out there for everybody. See, if you don't say anything about this bill, then you're okay with what we're doing. And this is what we're doing. And everybody's on, you know, so it's just very more um, shaming and mocking of the public. That's, you know what I mean? It's exactly what it is. Yeah. People yeah. find this argument about whether he was in blackface to be more troubling, a more troubling thing about him than that he was a doctor who seems to be okay with, you know, infanticide. Right, exactly. It's more troubling that he had a black, you know, and then now this whole debate about it was me, it wasn't me, you know, like I did it, I didn't really do it there, but I did do blackface as Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Like the whole, I mean, this is, this can't be real. Right. So he's walk, he's walking it back. You know, at first he was very, I mean, man, he fell on that sword again and again and again. Right. Mm -hmm. And he uh, is walking it back. So, well, maybe that's not me, you know, you know, before he's like, yeah, I made some really stupid mistakes. Mm -hmm. But then he, 
Then he gets to the whole Michael Jackson thing. So weird, right? So weird. Now, apparently, that photo, that is not him in blackface. Apparently, that's his current wife. And he's in, he's in the Klan outfit. Okay. Because they were at a party together. They were, they've been together since college. So apparently, that was the two of them at a party. So that's not him. That's his current wife. And he's the one in, in, the, in the Klan outfit, which... You know, does it make it any any worse? I mean, possibly, you know. Uh, yeah, so then let's go into some of the other things that are happening with this. You know, we've got him, and now we've got this hashtag Me Too thing with uh, Justin Fairfax, right? And Justin Fairfax is being accused. Let me see if I can pop, pop this up here. I'll give you, give you a visual of him. Justin Fairfax is being accused by a woman whose name, last name is Tyson, mm -hmm. and her first name is uh, Vanessa. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's Justin Fairfax. Well, wait, but the, I think the name Vanessa also means butterfly. Uh, interesting. The name Vanessa means butterfly. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. Some monarch programming maybe there. Mm -hmm. um, so, and here, so here's the embattled. Um, Lieutenant Governor. Right? Now, the backstory with this is that her, him, and and Vanessa Tyson had a like a long term relationship. So when they got together, and she quote unquote forced him to perform oral sex on him, right? She, he uh, forced her. He forced her. He forced her. I'm sorry, right. my bad. Yeah, yeah. He forced her to perform oral sex on him. Uh, it's not like, you know, he plucked her out of the hotel bar and popped her a roofie. Uh, they knew each other and they had a relationship. And he's like pushing back in this very hard. And her attorney now is um, the attorney that represented uh, Kavanaugh's girl. So, you know, this is sort of in the hashtag, you know, the Kavanaugh pipeline. Right. And, but it was, it was the biggest deal in the world for the Kavanaugh situation and in this situation, it seems to be like, it seems more like th th there doesn't seem to be the outrage in the media. Right. But it happened at a specific time. Like, you know, when they, when they had their, their uh, incident, that was in 2004. Right. So why are we just hearing about it now? So it's just 15 years later. Right. And, and now it's being brought up. Why? And you told me they were in a, re a relationship prior that wasn't. They were in a long-term relationship. Yeah. So he's forcefully, you know, denied what she's saying. Yeah. But the name, the name is interesting, right? Her last name is Tyson. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're into the you're into the name stuff. A Tyson that brings up this image of Mike Tyson. Right. And there's also Tyson, Virginia, Tyson right. Square, Virginia. It's called yep. Tyson Square. Yeah. And then Justin Fairfax. Fairfax is in, is a county and a city in Virginia. That's right. Northam. There's Norfolk, the North. there's all sorts of stuff like that, right? Of the, of the North. Of the North. So, but these are also all places in Virginia. But you were saying something that was interesting about the just in Fairfax. Like, just in Fairfax. Right? Here you go, right? You know, he's, or just in Fairfax. Like we allow these things to happen just in Fairfax, right? Or something like yeah. that, you know? There's all yeah. these takes on it. The Vanessa Tyson thing is interesting because of Tyson Corners, Virginia. They, maybe Vanessa, they do monarch programming in Fairfax, Virginia, or in Tyson Square, Virginia. I... For some reason that I can't really fully explain to you, I spent a fair amount of time in Tyson Square, Virginia in my 19th year, uh, my 18th and 19th year. Right. Uh, and you, when I would go there, I would actually stay with a woman who was the, the assistant to the uh, secretary of state. I think his name was Warren Christopher. Right? Oh, yeah. She right. Short his, guy. Really short guy. She was his secretary and I would stay with her. Yeah. Um, but uh, so then there's Mike Tyson who, yeah. you know, was, we talked about statutory rape, right? That's right. So Mike Tyson. Bit was, somebody's ear off. Like, we don't want you hearing about this, right? Yeah. So Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson went to prison because he was in a hotel room at uh, roughly 1.32 in the morning with Desiree Washington. Mm -hmm. in, in oh, Washington. Desiree Washington? Desire, yeah. wa so Desire Washington. So all these places are surrounding counties of Washington, D.C. That's very interesting. 
Yeah. And so Desiree Washington, who was, she was not a minor. She's an adult. And she's in Mike Tyson's hotel room at 1.30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. What do you think is going to happen? Right. You know, I mean, let's be, let's be real about this. So that sent Mike to jail. And uh, he was not the same person when he came out. And when he came out, Don King got his claws in him and uh, basically took everything from uh, Mike Tyson. But there's association with Tyson, Mike Tyson, well, statutory rape. And know, then the and, other thing when you think about a particular boxer is float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Right. That's, right? That's one, yeah, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Ali. So there's a butterfly reference when you're thinking about boxing. And even though Muhammad Ali is a very different kind of boxer than Mike Tyson, they're like, uh, you know, they're thought of so differently, but they're two of the, you know, most famous boxers of all time, their mm-hmm. own unique styles that were, you know, not repeatable by anybody else really, right? Yeah, it's true. So yeah. it is, and, and boxing, right? This is what's going on. We're, 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 I mean, that's what politics is at this point. It's a, it's a, it's a sparring match. It's a boxing mm-hmm. match. Mm-hmm. And we all know that a lot of these fights are f- fixed, just like the politics are fixed. Mm-hmm. Right. And they're controlled just like Don King controls the, the, the boxing. Right. There's people that are controlling these political situations. It's very possible. This is all dog and pony show and that they're all you know, in on it together and being controlled. It's kind of like the Joe Rogan, Alex Jones thing. Yeah. You have to really consider that on some level. Right. Um, because if you don't, you're not looking at all the, all the particular angles. Yeah. And then the, 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 the third guy is this guy over here. And hilarious, and, yeah. And, and he's lieutenant governor, right? The attorney general. This is the attorney general, and this is uh, Mark Herring. You know, so you've got Ms. the guy from the north, right? Ralph from the north, and, and he's wearing have, a red tie, so he could be a red herring, right? <laughs> right. So, so you have he's a Mark, and then there's the Herring, and then you have Justin Fairfax. I mean. The names alone are just, you know, they're... they're do, you, do you remember on Golden Girls when Rose would talk about the Herring Circus? You know, I, I have to say that I was, I was not a... She used to talk about, black, back in St. Olaf, you know, and she'd talk about the Herring Circus, mm-hmm. right? All the time, guys, go back and watch all episodes. So maybe this is, the, maybe this is about to become the Herring Circus. <laughs> well, the one guy that... <laughs> you were talking about circuses and carnivals yeah, when you were telling me about it. About the mark. Yeah, absolutely. So... The one person that would stand to benefit from all this is a guy by the name of Kirk Roy. Because Kirk Roy, if all three of these, if all three uh, of these clowns, uh, Justin Fairfax, Ralph Northam, and Mark Herring, if they all bite the dust, Kirk Roy becomes the governor of Virginia. And he's a Republican, right? He is a Republican, okay. and his uh, Roy, of course, means king. Right? Like, yeah, I was going to say Roy, Roy, Roy Rogers, or right? It's Royale, right? Royale. Royale. Yeah. So, so the king, the king assumes the. Uh, the what does the name the, Kirk mean? My sister always talks about my nephew Kirking out, like he's acting all like wild and retarded and whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't broken Kirk down, hmm. but um, but Kirk Roy would assume. You know, leadership in Virginia. Crazy royalty. So he'd be the king of the Commonwealth because mm-hmm. that's what they refer to Virginia as, as the Commonwealth. Mm-hmm. So you want to shift gears and get into some of the Super Bowl stuff? So, yeah, well, yeah let's take the uh, butterfly and uh, move right, right over to the tattoo that either does or doesn't exist on Adam Levine. <laughs> right. So let's, let's get into Adam Levine's tattoos. We get into some of the Super Bowl symbolism. Mm-hmm. And because I've got a number of. Uh, of Adam Levine pictures with his tattoos. So let me get into uh, share mode. I have to go to the bathroom. So while you get into share mode, let's both hit pause for one second. One, two, three, hit pause. Sorry about that, guys. Nature called. Anyway, so our, we're going to get into uh, Super Bowl and what you got for us. Well, I just want to bring up a few images here with the Super okay. Bowl. So here's uh, Adam Levine. This is one kind of sideways image. Because you can get a really uh, wow, clear. Wow, that's definitely a butterfly. Shot of the butterfly. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the, that look at those eyes. It almost looks like an owl. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a specific type of butterfly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, yes, it's, <clears throat> excuse me. It's got the owl image. And those aren't the only eyes um, plastered onto his body. 
So I, this is a good shot of the butterfly. I'll give you another uh, shot here. One sec. And you can see more of the uh, painted topography of his body. The inked landscape, here we go. All right, so now you can see wow. here's the butterfly. Ooh. Now, what we have here, of course. I'm feeling, ooh, I have, uh, okay, I, I find his tattoos to be very triggering. There's a lot of triggering going on here. Yep. So here we have the lion, right, Leo. I almost feel like I'm going to throw up. And then you, above, above the lion, you have California. Mm -hmm. And then you have the eagle. And, yeah. you know, so we astrologically, we're dealing, yep. we're, we're dealing with Aquarius, mm -hmm. Leo. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the um, alchemical, mm -hmm. basically, you know, uh, quadricity or, or quadrant of Leo and Aquarius and Scorpio and Taurus, right? So um, what's, on, what's on that hand that's holding the flower? Okay. Um, let, me, let me just go through this a little bit more. Okay, sorry. That's all right. And so above, he, okay, so now we have a woman who is gazing at the lion, right? And the lion is, is gazing back at this, this mm -hmm. woman. Um, she looks like, it looks like it might be a representation of maybe Quan Yin. I mean, it looks, looks Chinese. I, you know, I can zoom in a little bit on that, see if we can get a different take. What do you think, Emily? It looks more like a flapper girl to me. Flapper. Okay. Okay. So they're definitely connecting. Now that lion, right, it almost looks like. It's a lion and a bull together. Yeah. You see it's that? It's like a hybrid. Yeah. You know, so we've got a lion because it's got the mane of a lion and it looks like a bull. So now we're definitely, we're definitely into the, uh, the alchemy of the fixed sign because that would be a combination of Taurus mm -hmm. and, Leo. and Leo. And I would assume maybe somewhere in here. Okay. So back here, do you see the scales? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's 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 uh, the snake or the reptile, and that's Scorpio. Mm -hmm. So here we have the lion bull and the eagle scorpion or the eagle snake. So this is alchemical, right? He's got the he's got the alchemical combination of the fixed signs, and these are chimeras. Yep, chimeras. That's what I meant. Not hybrid. The chimeras. Yeah, the yeah. chimeras, and then California is sandwiched between these chimerical slash alchemical images as above so below right right so there's so there's an alchemical operation happening in his third chakra and his second chakra okay interesting so we have power on a material plane and power on a submaterial plane yeah okay over here um i believe the dr is our initials for his his wife okay um and who's from the namibia interesting she's a model from namibia we'll get into her in a second so i think what is this like true love or something like that but i can't see what that says but that also looks like it could be some kind of owl on the hand um yeah it could be and what about but, that but I see the word, and then there's the rose over the heart Right. So now he's into the heart chakra. Mm -hmm. And then he has the angel with a boxing glove. Right. And a black eye. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Chair, the chair of the lo love bites. Love's going to knock you out. And then this is a symbol for Gemini in duality. Right. The 11. Yep. It also looks like a pause sign, a pause button. Mm -hmm. Now this that is looks like a 144 to me. Yeah, and this is this is Sanskrit, which I've not decoded. Well, it also looks like 144, and I'm thinking about the 144,000 from the Bible, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. there's you know a lot of discussion that goes on around that, and whether that was actually talking about people or a frequency or whatever. But you know, there's the idea that there are 144,000 original souls, and everything else is just some iteration or copy of that, and that you know 
for those of us in like MK circles, we've talked about, you know, is that sort of what these projects and programs are about is finding the 144,000, you know, original souls and trying to put a pause on them. So what can be, what, what they're here to do cannot happen, right? Like trying to put a pause on, you know, if, you know, if those people or those spirits or souls have come in at this time to, you know, for some purpose or reason, and, you know, programs are to sort of manipulate, take control, or put pause on their ability to access, you know, what they're trying to do. So it's interesting to me that the Gemini, the, the duality, which is what- Duality, it's also the twin towers, right? Twin towers, 11 is an interesting number, right, also. Yeah. Um, so that's all very interesting. He has, he has a lot of floral designs on his arm, but over here, we have the eye of illumination. Mm -hmm. With lots of rays, the sun right. is in there. Right. This is this is this is the all also the, also the, like the outline of like a um, an octagon, right? Mm -hmm. Or like a you know yeah there. So we have the all see. So he he's the eye has heterochromia, which is another characteristic of people in projects and programs. Interesting. M multiple colors within one eye. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you know that's the tour. Uh, th this is very interesting. It is. You know, somebody knew what they were doing here. The bird snake. That's like you know. So absolutely, it's 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 Aquarius and it's Scorpio, and here we have Taurus and Leo. Mm -hmm. They're connected. And California's California is this place mm -hmm. where so, this alchemical operation is happening. And well, he and he's from California, right? You know, and I think the and it's double sided. Like California is a really magical place, right? It's a place where good magic can happen. It's a place where bad magic can happen. All the oh, elements absolutely. are here for either. Absolutely. Um, so if you, if you go to his, his backside. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I've got, there's, there's one, I don't want to use this one. There's another image I want to use. If you go to his backside, um, there's some symbolism here, but it, it also is an homage to his, his wife. So I'll show you. So here's the, the elaborate backscape. Mm -hmm. um, so we have six swallows mm. that are surrounding this kind of tapestry. And uh, the mermaid, so we have a mermaid here. Mm -hmm, with the skull. And so, yes, she's craving the skull. And I believe the mermaid is his wife. Mm -hmm, yep. You, you can yep. see the facial resemblance. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, and the whole mermaid imagery is, is, is interesting, right? She's mythic and not real. She's aqueous you know, and she's cradling death, right? Mm -hmm. That's what she's doing. And, and the, the six, the six swallows are interesting because, uh, Tom Brady and Bill Belichick won their sixth Super Bowl, Of course. Together. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have, now, not everybody on that Patriots team has won six Super Bowls. Right. Okay. Just Brady and Belichick. That's it. You know, so you, and you want to throw in Bob Kraft maybe. Right. So that's six. So you have six, six, six with the Super Bowl. And you have six with the, uh, the Swallows. I don't know what this is. You know, Where? Is right here on the, the left, his left elbow. The guitar thing. Yeah, well, what what the heck is that? Is that oh, it's a guitar. Thank you. It's like a guitar or ukulele or something. No, it yeah. is a guitar. I was looking at I was looking at it from a different perspective. I was like, guitar. I didn't see the frame. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now he's got a guitar on his left hand or left arm. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of the other stuff is kind of floral and sort of you know, there's wings here mm -hmm. on his left arm. Um, anyway, I found like oh, and then he's got this like. If he could have just dropped his short, his pants a little lower, mm -hmm. he could have had a great product placement deal. Yeah. You know, he <laughs> he's told actually, me. Like, he's gotten quite a bit bigger. He's much more muscular than he used to be. He used to be. Oh, so this guy. Yeah. He used to be really skinny, but now he's worked out and he likes showing off his, his buff body. He's got a commercial out with uh, one of these male fragrances. It's totally obnoxious. The axe. Yeah. Oh my God. The he gets up body. on the roof and he's like. He's had that for, remember he was also in the, um, What's it called? The skin commercials? The um, what's the acne product that they're always on TV with? Oh yeah, you know one. what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. Yeah, the one that actually ruins your skin. Um, yeah. 
but uh, the one that has the Morgellons in it, I think. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, um, okay. So I have an interesting connection. I have two interesting connections to Adam Levine, one of which I cannot share at this time, but hopefully in the future I'll be able to share. Mm. And the second I will share, and that is that I sat, so I was in about three and a half years ago, I was in the, I can't remember the name of it, but there was like an, Mexican and Asian fusion restaurant inside the Cosmopolitan Hotel mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. And uh, me and my dad were having lunch over there. And then we were the only table in the restaurant at the time. And then someone sat down at the table right next to us and it was four people and three, you know, they looked like manager crew and someone that looks to me like Adam Levine. Right. right? And mm -hmm. uh, they all had, you know, the credentials kind of around their neck right look like they were there for like a concert or something mm -hmm. I was, well, that's interesting so i was you know like I, I as soon as they got up and left i told my dad who i thought it was right mm -hmm. and um but i wasn't 100 percent sure because i don't I, I couldn't tell you one maroon five song i have no idea it's not like something i pay close attention to but he looks mm -hmm. familiar right right and we got back to the hotel we happened to be staying at the luxor and when we got back to the hotel, I noticed that on the magazine that is like for the hotel, mm -hmm. that th there's a picture of Adam Levine on the front because they're having a concert there that night at the uh, Mandalay Bay, which is connected to the Luxor. They're owned by the same people, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and he's on the cover. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that was Adam Levine because he's playing here tonight. That makes sense, right? Right. But the d funny thing was, is the person sitting next to me in the restaurant didn't have any tattoos. And when he's on the cover of the magazine, he had his arms kind of like this or something like that. And you could see all these tattoos. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if the tattoos are fake. And this would go along with everything else. So here's, here's what I think. I think he has like a frame set with his tattoos. Mm -hmm. Like um, his, because I actually found images of his tattoos where it's just like his arms. Mm-hmm. So I think his arm tattoos and his back tattoo are probably permanent. Mm -hmm. I think the stuff going on in his belly, or I think that that might be temporary, and that he could be he could be using that for whatever purpose, like he did. I mean, at this time, this was four years ago. This person now, it's possible that he has a body double, and that was who I was sitting next to. I don't, you know, you know what I mean. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but this person looked exactly like the same person and mm -hmm. he did not have tattoos on his arms. So, you know, he also is Jewish and there's a lot of Jewish people who, you know, think that that's not good to get tattoos. And, yeah. I mean, that's and, part of it. It's a bad, bad thing. Right. right? So, yeah. um, it is, it dawned on me that the tattoos may just come, it, it may be entirely fake. He may have, you know, something that he puts on just for shows or when he goes on tour or what, I don't know. Like, I'm not saying for sure. Yes or no. But mm -hmm. this was an interesting experience I had. Of course, I had it in Las Vegas, which is a weird place of, you know, it's an, it's an extra dimension of total delusion. Right. Um, but uh, I thought that was really interesting. So just like all these other things we've been talking about, like, you know, fake situation in Virginia and the fake situation with Joe Rogan and, and uh, uh, Alex Jones and whatever, this is possibly another situation of, you know, synthesis. I also, there's, you know, you talked about there being all these commercials for, uh, robots or clone kinds of things during the Super Bowl. And, you know, we talk about that in terms of celebrities too. Mm -hmm. um, and he's certainly not immune to that possibility. I mean, is it, are we always seeing the same person? Right? It's true. Um, there was a lot of other stuff going on during that halftime show. Let's hear it. Well, so one of the things that, let's see if I can find. Uh, an image here really quickly. Uh, so Travis Scott mm -hmm. is an interesting character. He's, uh, he's a baby daddy of one of the Jenner girls. I think he's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one of the Jenner girls, Ky Kylie Jenner. Mm -hmm. I, I get, you know, I'm not up on that, but he's, they have a kid together and he's, he's like the rapper uh, of the moments. And, uh, he he actually kind of crossed a line for the Super Bowl to be able to perform there, and um, because there was this whole Colin Kaepernick right contingency that wanted uh, black artists to boycott the Super Bowl right, and it was a big deal. And 
So Travis Scott shows up, and he's got really no – yes, Kylie Jenner. Okay. That's her name. Um, so there's really no connection with Travis Scott and Adam Levine and Maroon 5. So they're kludging. They do it at these, at these Super Bowls. They'll kludge artists together and try mm -hmm. to make something – unique get mashed up but there was this weird transition that takes place during that and what happens is that there is a there's a spongebob video and it's it's a, it's part of like an episode of spongebob where spongebob and his crew surface at a super bowl and they play the halftime show to super bowl and it's a song called Sweet Victory. Mm -hmm. And this is this weird transition. It was really strange if you look at, like, um, if, if, you, if you looked at uh, the, uh, this, the if, if you looked at the, if you looked at the, the, the comments on the Super Bowl halftime performance, there were a ton of people who were really pissed off that the SpongeBob song didn't get played out. Like, I mean, that was like, Huge complaints. But the lead-in is the SpongeBob cartoon. Then all these fireballs come in. And the fireballs are – They're asteroids. And then Travis Scott comes in, and he's on one of the fireballs. And he becomes – when he starts to, to do his rapping thing, he's in the center of this sun. Mm -hmm. Right? So Travis Scott plays the role of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And he's the fallen angel that comes in to illuminate the halftime show. Mm -hmm. And yeah. let, me see, let me see if I can come up with a picture. Around well, another that. connection that might be between there's a connection that might exist between Travis Scott and uh, Adam Levine is that I don't know where Travis Scott is from, but he's been with Kylie Jenner. Kylie Jenner's <clears throat> family lives, you know, in Calabasas same, in the same area that Adam Levine's family lives in. Mm -hmm. Right, Adam Levine's family like lives in that same area near where I work. Right, it's all in that sort of Calabasas, the girl Westlake Village area of of Los Angeles. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's going on there? Right. So uh, here's a here's a quick picture. I think I found one. I had one already set aside, but I couldn't. I, I lost it. But there's a, there's a quick picture of this moment where Travis Scott is. The plane in these flames, and the whole thing becomes this kind of illuminated landscape. So there is definitely an illuminati theme, illuminated theme in the Super Bowl. I mean, they do it every year, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is a. I mean, and we were talking about fire in that area of Los Angeles earlier, right? And this is a ritual to. I I believe that the halftime show was a ritual to, to Lucifer. Isn't it pretty much always? It's either like yeah. Molech or Satan or Lucifer. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. So I'm just going to bring this up here. At least the this superb one. Superb owl, right? The superb owl. So here he is. Right. So this is right after he makes the entrance, you know, you know from the animated fireballs hitting the stage. Mm -hmm. And he's in, now these, these uh, spikes right here. You see them? Yeah. These are the rays of the sun. Uh huh. Okay. So he is illuminated. So he, he is the solar deity that's, that's uh, performing at the Super Bowl. And then when you have Big Boy come in, Big Boy happens to be an Aquarian. I don't know what Travis Scott's sign is, but Travis Scott clearly is in the center of the sun, which is ruled by Leo. So now you have Aquarius and Leo coming together again, right? And Big Boy, uh, his crew is called the Atlians, which mm -hmm. are the, the aliens from Atlanta, right? That's, mm -hmm. their, that's their thing. So now you have, you know, the asteroids, the fireballs, you have Lucifer, you have this alien contingency from Atlanta, which is the new Atlantis. Right. But it's, you know, and then you have Maroon 5. And Maroon 5 is being stranded, right? You're, you're stranded. That's being marooned. Okay. And, and 5 is the number of man. Okay. You, you know, when you look at da, Vin da Vinci's divine man, you have one arm and one arm, and you have the two legs, and you have the head. Yeah. That's the number five, right? Yeah. So, I mean, clearly, there was another ritualized hyper event going on during the Super Bowl. 
and everything kind of ends in flames. It was a lot more muted than some of the others. There was a lot of people that thought there wasn't much going on during this halftime show, but if you look deeply enough, there really was. There was a lot going on. Yeah, but it wasn't everything. quite as in your face as like Madonna's thing or whatever, right? Madonna's it was a little more was, subtle. So off the charts. So I know we were kind of running out of time. I just wanted to burn through a few other things. Yeah. Really quickly. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, the, so the ads, the AI ads dominated yeah. the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I mean dominate. And so what we had were two very striking, compelling. Again, we're dealing with duality, which is the, uh, the stock and trade. It is the, it is the magical yep. stock and trade. So these were two of the, the Super Bowl ads. Um, that one on the right is so disturbing. The, the, I know. Ugh. Ugh. Right. And then, then you have the Terminator version. Mm-hmm. So we have, you know, this weirdly strange baby divine, you know. I'm feeling a little sick to my stomach here. Right. And I then you have this. Right. So, yeah. so we're getting both. We're getting, they're, they're crunching us, right? They're, they're, they're mashing us with this. And that, that it's, it's, it's benevolent and it's evil. That's right. Both. It's light yes. and it's dark, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not even human anymore. We've no. taken this dualistic proposition and now moved it into the AI realm. So there's a few other images that I wanted to share here. Um, Salon did a, actually a really good piece on, on, the, on the whole halftime spectacle. So I just want to bring that up really quickly. And um, let me do this screen share here of this. So this is from Salon. And uh, the nervous laughter of the Super Bowl's robot ads. So basically, what's going on here is that, that they're building in a sense of apprehension with this coming wave of automation. Right. And they're getting people to kind of laugh at it like it's a joke, mm -hmm. poke fun at it. But at the same time, they're tapping into kind of this existential yep. sort of fear that people are starting to have around what can, what can take place. Mm -hmm. So here we have those two images. Uh, so Intuit is, you know, it's a, a company that does TurboTax. Yeah. And they've been doing these ads lately with, um, well, there's Simple Safe, right? And here's another robot, another one of the robot ads. I wanted to, so this is the, I'm going to play this. I've got the sound down. So it's a very quick ad. This is the Michelob ad. The Michelob Ultra Super Bowl, which is short yes. for the MK Ultra Super Bowl. Super there you Bowl. go. Yeah. So here, so here's the robots, and they're just outperforming everybody, right? It's like a guy hits a ball, and the robot just, you know, smacks the shit out of it. I, I, there was a Michelob Ultra ad, like this big banner that was on the uh, free, right off the 101 freeway, also in Calabasas. That looked right. like it had Simone Biles in it to me. It was either Simone Biles or someone who looks just like her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was interesting to me that yeah, Michelob is totally with this whole kind of uh, this whole kind of thing. Um, there's running in a lot of their ads. Right. This idea, you know, there, I think part of the combination of this AI stuff, because there's a lot of things like that around the tennis as well. Like a lot of those first IBM Watson ads came around the tennis. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are sports where they're starting to introduce the possibility of robots and AIs and clones and stuff. And I think this is two sports where we're seeing that, right? We talked about Tom Brady last time being, you know, the football robot. But one of the things that also happened in the last several weeks that we not, didn't just talk about was that Naomi Osaka won her second straight uh, Grand Slam title. And in her press conference afterwards, she talked about basically playing like a robot or being a robot. Right. At first I thought, okay, I just, I understood, like, if I was a gymnast, I know sometimes you go into, like, a dissociative mode. I took it that way at first, and then I started thinking. She has a history of having some of the most awkward appearances and press conferences ever, where it right. seems like she's trying to use certain words or terms or ideas, but doesn't actually understand what they mean, so it comes out awkward. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what a robot or a clone or something that wasn't really human would do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, while they have intelligence, they don't have the same kind of, you know, a, a, understanding of nuance and context right 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 so we have tom brady naomi osaka being the victors of the two biggest sporting events so far this year right and both of them have elements about them that are robot like right 
Um, yes, really quickly, you see this image? Yeah. So this is an Asian woman who's part of the commercial. And what do we think of with Asian? Like she's, she's there for a reason. Right, we think of robots, we think of Japan and robots. You think of Japan, you think of robots, you think of people that are very, very perfection-oriented, right? And Naomi Osaka's half Japanese. Right, and so she's what does she do? She's Haitian she's, and Japanese, and Haitians gets, are about zombies, right? She gets, absolutely, she gets outperformed by the robot. Mm -hmm. So here's the Intuit ad that I, that I wanna play really quickly. So what's interesting about these guys in this intuitive, here's the little, you know, the weird little robot baby comes to life, right? And he, this is his father. He call, he's calling him daddy. It's bizarre. It's totally bizarre. And if you look at, let me just stop the video here. If you look at the three people, they've been in a series of ads. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they all that are- The guy on the right is really weird. He's very weird. He's got really super long hair. Um, and he almost looks like a woman. Right. Yeah, like and, somewhere between a woman and a caveman. Yeah, and then the, the girl is always tough. She doesn't smile. She's a sourpuss. Mm -hmm. She's obviously super smart, cynical. And then you have kind of the, the soy boy, right, who's a geek. I mean, advertising is just getting really ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Um, and then there was this one at, I'm not even sure we should get into We should save this for another time. Yeah. Well, let's save the ASVR stuff for another time. Okay. Because that we could, we need to spend time with that. And that actually, it is so like, weird. That actually triggered you. Yeah. So what, what let's, let's you and I get back together. Let's do another mash okay. next week and, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Okay. That sounds good. All right, cool. Um, so I guess then that let's put it, let's put a bow on this one. So, uh, I think everything we talked about, although they seem totally separate, were always tied together by a theme from the last one. So yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, Emily, it's been great hanging out with you. It always is. Mashing got, it up. Absolutely, guys. We'll be back real soon with another mash. If you want an astrological reading, hit Robert up at robertphoenix.com. You can find yeah. me at offplanetradio.com if you're interested in a nutritional consultation. Lifestyle, lifestyle concentration, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer. And uh, I'm getting a little more action in that area lately. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, you know where to find us. Cool. Bye, everybody. All righty. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye.